Okay, so uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about something new again, like you've done many times or you've thought about many times or had inflicted on you several times. And that is just, just getting us from populations to samples to confidence intervals to t test, you know, that that initial realm of just understanding, at least with uh, parametric stats, what we're doing when we sample a population and inferences that we want to make from it. Um, so there's three characters there that were important historically and really interesting and, and uh, very uh, creepy evil side of both Pearson and Fisher. Pe Pearson and Fisher, when I was doing undergrad and grad stats in the, in the late 70s, um, they were the gods. And, and to some extent, they still are. Uh, Ronald Fisher, you know, everybody knows the F test. F is for Fisher. Um, Pearson's R, little r. And for some reason, when I say little r, I always say little r, like I'm you know, going down the pathway. Anyway, uh, the correlation coefficient, Pearson came up with that. And they did a bunch of other stuff as well. But there's this kind of weird dark side with both of them uh, involving eugenics and all other stuff. So we won't dwell on that today. There's uh, ghosts. <laughs> Who looks like uh, one of my fellow actors? There. Sorry. Um, of course, is the parent of the normal distribution. There we go. Sorry about that clunk that you heard in the microphone there. So, so again, I'm taking a huge amount of stats that you had to learn, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna really not dumb it down, but I'm going to express it to you as efficiently as possible. Because remember, our obsession in this course is about dealing with data. I don't care. I've never been interested in the theory behind stats. I want to use it to look at my data, to understand the system that I'm working on. And I'm presuming that's true of you as well. So if we look at a population, and let's say that um, I'm... I'm looking at the first year students here at Ontario Tech, and I wanna find out something about their age distribution. So if I go out, I come up with some method of sampling them, and uh, I collect that information from a bunch of students. <laughs> and this might be the distribution. And the point I'm trying to make here is that there's all sorts of, I mean, this probably is the distribution you see. We've got frequency on the y-axis there. We've got age on the x-axis. So for some weird reason among these first-year students, we're seeing a lot here where, I don't know if that's 17 and, and uh, very few that are 18, a bunch that are 19. You know, it's the point I'm trying to make is this is not in any way resembling a normal distribution, a bell curve. It's just a distribution. And this is true of any research that we might want to do. That the distribution of individuals, when I collect a sample, let's say I've gone out and, and asked the age of 150 first year students, um, does not, to do the things we want to do with it in various stat analysis does not have to be normal. But the interesting thing is, and you probably did a whole bunch of mindless exercises to show this, um, to show something called the central limit theorem, is that if I went out many, many times, and each time found 150 first-year students and recorded their ages and recorded the sample mean, if I did that a bunch of times, and, and you know, stats, your stats courses, they always refer to this, you know, like, why would I do that a bunch of times? It's just, again, to, to set up this idea of a distribution of those sample means rather than a distribution of the individuals. So those sample means, if I repeat that process, which I'm not gonna do in real life, but if I did, those sample means would be normally distributed. And that's the central limit theorem. And that's very important in when we're trying to do things like uh, calculate confidence intervals, as we'll talk about in a minute, or later do t-tests or other significance tests. So, Again, as I 
put it in words here, imagine taking many, many samples of size n, and we usually, again, uh, just to get you used to really being careful about um, terminology and symbology. So we use little n, there I go again, little n to be the size of the sample. Big N is the size of the population. So we take many, many samples of size little n, and in each case, every time we take a sample, yeah, the mean is the sum of the observations divided by the number of observations. No, no, nothing hugely sophisticated there. As I was just saying, the sample means tend, to, or tend towards normal uh, distribution. The mean of the means, and this has been shown by theoretical statisticians going back to um, Pearson and Fisher and others, is mu, the population mean. So mu, which most of you, or if not all of you have heard of, it's like a U with a tail on the front end. It's the Greek letter mu, mu like a cat, mu's, mu, mu. <laughs> Didn't really sound like a cat, but anyway. Um, so the mean of those means is the true population mean that we're trying to estimate, okay? The standard deviation of the distribution, so this is where it gets tricky, you know, and, and everybody's confused about standard deviation versus standard error and all that stuff. So here's where you finally understand it, if it's ever been confusing to you. So think about that initial distribution of individuals in blue there. That's got a mean, even though it's a weird distribution, you could calculate a mean from it, obviously. And it's got a standard deviation, right? Remember last time we were talking about, okay, if I want to describe a sample, different things I can use, the variability in the sample, I could use the range, I could use standard deviation. So when it comes to the sample means, their variability is the standard deviation among individuals divided by the square root of the sample size. So the variability, the width of that bell that I was showing you, see the sample means, the thin, the thin black line that's the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve. The width of that, that's a measure of how variable the sample means are. And that width gets narrower if I've taken a bigger sample size. And that's reflected in this equation that you see at the bottom, where the standard deviation of the mean, sometimes called, and this is where it gets confusing for people, the standard error of the mean, is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size, okay? So if you look at that equation, that equation is, is quite profound in a couple of ways. One is sigma, just bare bones sigma, that standard deviation, that has to do with how variable the ages of students are, you know, in my study. It's not, has to do, it doesn't have anything to do with how much work I do, you know, how many observations I call it. How variable are they? They might be all 18 or 19, or they might vary in age from 17 to 62. But that number is going to summarize how variable uh, those individuals are. The bottom of that equation is how much work I did, you know, how many observations I took. So both of those, are determining how variable the sample means that I've taken are, okay? So, you know, flashback to uh, nightmares you had about, you know, what proportion of, of uh, values of income are greater than this and a normally distributed income with a mean of $12,000. You, you remember all those exercises. So normal distribution, the bottom line with it is you know, given a certain value of the mean and the standard deviation, what proportion of values in that distribution are greater than or less than a certain value. So in this case, this is the so-called standard normal distribution where mu, mu, 
the mean is zero of the population, the standard deviation is one. So, and you can see the bell-shaped curve there. So the mean of zero is right in the middle of that, of that normal distribution. And there's 50% of the observations, or 50% of the values are bigger than that, 50% are smaller than that in a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, there's, uh, I guess, 5% of the values are bigger than two or less than minus two. So, and again, you remember all the exercises, but the really important thing to remember is if we know it's normally distributed, we know the proportion of values that are in certain ranges across that distribution, okay? So the middle 95%, as I said, and this becomes significant, bad word to use, this becomes important when we're doing confidence intervals or we're doing hypothesis tests. The middle 95% of that normal distribution is plus or minus 1.96, about two times the standard deviation, and that's among individuals, okay? Okay. So. You've heard of the normal distribution. You've also heard of the T distribution, right? And what's the difference? Well, look at the formula on the, on the top there. It looks kind of the same as two slides ago at the bottom where sigma, that's, that's the kind of like uh, the squiggle with the cap on it there, sigma subscript X bar. So the standard deviation of the mean equals sigma, the standard deviation divided by the square root of N. In the case of this very similar formula here, we've got S rather than sigma subscript X bar equals S rather than sigma divided by the square root of N. And so the T distribution it's very, exactly the same as the normal in the sense that it's a symmetric distribution about the mean. The difference is that you're not sure of the standard deviation of the population. So in the first slide we looked at, we could, we could tell the standard deviation of the mean by just dividing the standard deviation of the population, that is among individuals, by the square root of sample size. But in this case, we don't know the standard deviation of the population. You know, I don't know the standard deviation of the whole population of first years when I go out to sample 150 of them. So in that case, this standard deviation of the sample mean, estimated standard deviation of the sample mean is the standard deviation among individuals divided by the square root of n. So there's second, or third, might even be the fourth profound statement I want to make today is we never know. We never know sigma, right? Now you may say, well, if you're doing your study, Bob, of first years, you know, there's somewhere there's a list of all first years and how old, so we would know the whole population. But when we're doing research, real research, doesn't matter whether it's in the lab or in the field, we never know the whole population. We're always doing a sample. Those of you, I don't know how many people here are focused on lab work. Maybe you two both. Yeah, so sometimes people think, and I don't know, Emily, you're, you're field-based, I think? Yeah, I'm completely field-based. So it's easy for those of us, like, don't put me in a lab, something will blow up. So it's easy for those of us who are based in the field to get this, you know, like, yeah, I'm always sampling. I never know everything. Those in the lab sometimes think, well, you know, I've only got the 25 Petri dishes in the growth chamber. That's the population. And the weird thing about lab studies, and you may already know this, is that, um, what you're doing when you set up an experiment like that is you're sampling from a hypothetical population of your experimental units in those conditions. So it's still, you're still dealing with the sample size. You're still sampling from a population. It's just more of a hypothetical population. But in both, I mean, and 
really, when I'm sampling uh, mussels in a lake, it's just as hypothetical, you know, I, I take a sample and of course there's a lot of interesting stuff, which we'll talk about later about how you do that sample and such. But thinking of the population as a whole and what I'm sampling from, it's really in many ways, just as hypothetical and theoretical as the situation in the lab. But just to, I just wanna point that out because um, it's sometimes, especially among some lab colleagues I have, not so much in bio, but in chemistry and uh, molecular developmental biology. Sometimes they, this is, you know, this is the section I have, that's it. And none of your stat stuff supporting what you don't really know is true, you know, all of that. They're sampling from the universe and oftentimes misinterpretation. And we'll look for this when we look at those papers that you present at the end of the course. Um, it has to do with not really having fully got your head around about what you, you know, what your process in sampling may have led you to versus what you think it led you to. And Flavia, just because I know your study, you know, the, the, I think you're focused on the taper, right? So in Flavia's case, there was a treatment done, you know, adjacent to uh, docks in, in Lake Scugog and Canal Lake. And she looked at the effect in the lake of various things of this treatment that was done in this, in this patch of lake and um, making conclude, you know, it, it's an interesting thing thinking about how she sampled, how that's representative of her the sampling space is representative or not of her inference space, what she wants to infer from that. And it can be the most interesting, but also the most vexing part of doing a study. Same thing, in, and those of you who work in a lab have heard this with regard to the reality of your treatments. You know, like, like okay, I've shown this with zebrafish that are growing between 18 and 19 degrees in these conditions how does my sample space compare to my inference space that I want to apply that to? Okay, so back to the T distribution. So essentially what you're doing, remember the width of that normal distribution is a reflection of how variable those sample means are. So with the T distribution, you're kind of paying a price in not knowing the, st the true standard deviation because you're not just estimating the mean when you take your sample, you're also estimating the standard deviation. And it's really interesting and I'll spare you the agony of doing it, but if you, if you think about a population, if you have a hypothetical population, like I think we've got maybe 3,000 first year students here and I take samples of different sizes from that population and see what happens to my estimate of the mean and see what happens to my estimate of the standard deviation as you change the sample size, all, all that kind of thing. Because in both cases, you're estimating something from the population. The mean, which tends to be people's fixation, you know, when they're collecting data like that, but you're also collecting the standard deviation. So what this, the yellow table is showing you on the left, on the right is just, um, you're sort of, paying for that lack of knowledge of sigma and paying more if your sample size, if you've done less work, if your sample size is smaller. And that that gets to the sort of, uh, the width of the confidence intervals we can calculate and the uh, power that we have when we do statistical tests on, on that kind of data. Okay. It's now 22 and uh, Flavia, you didn't, uh choke me or make choking noises so but I'll, I'll keep the pace up here um so with that standard deviation of the estimate and and you know of course we're, we're often focused on um i'm just noticing a, a typo in this uh we're we're just uh we're focused on that mean right and that should that big formula should be x bar plus or minus a T value, which reflects the size of that uh, T distribution times the standard error of, of uh, X bar, standard error of the mean. And that, that's the formula you've probably seen a million times. Um, 
for the uh, for calculating a confidence interval. I'll show it to you graphically in a second. Um, but I guess the the point here is that again, I don't know how many of you have done this, but you can do confidence intervals on things other than means. You can calculate confidence intervals for standard deviations. And oftentimes, especially in biology, variability is as interesting, at least as interesting as, um, as what the typical value is. So if we look at a confidence interval graphically, um, there you see uh, the, the X bar, the sample mean that I've got when I've uh, collected my sample of the first years. And this is, this is, I think, the first situation where we come against that, that intro stats terminology. Remember, I, I definitely still remember this from multiple choice tests when I took stats. You know, you can't say there's a 95% chance that the true mean is between. I'm 95% confident, and that's a totally different thing. And you, you remember all that. I, I still remember my stats prof yelling at me about that. But anyway, there's graphically showing you when I've, when I've uh, calculated the mean, my sample mean, from just doing one sample. We're no longer in this zone of um, uh, doing a multitude of samples. But I've calculated my, my sample mean. I'm using the fact that sample means, if I did repeatedly sample, are normally distributed, therefore t distributed, because I don't, I don't know the true standard deviation. And there's graphically showing, showing me, um, based on the size of that standard error of the mean, standard deviation of the mean, and the size of the t distribution, how wide that confidence interval is. And remember, when we're calculating a confidence interval, if I said to you, I, I mean, it's always good to, to sort of ground truth yourself and say, well, okay, I've done my study of first year students um, and I got a confidence interval, 95% confidence interval of somewhere between 16 and 31 years of age. And that's not a very, I think you'll agree, that's not a very impressive Confidence interval, I said, I did my confidence interval, 95% confidence interval is between 17.1 and 17.3 years of age. That second one sounds a lot better. So, and what we're doing, the difference between those is a matter of precision, right? There's always this, and I don't, I don't dwell on this a lot, a lot, but there, there's, you know, very popular in stats, exams and tests, it's the difference between accuracy and precision. You know that, remember that whole thing? And I used to use a target, like an um, archery target, where, um, and, and think about it, if you, if you did repeated measurements and they were all really close together, but they were wrong, <laughs> that would be precise, but inaccurate. If you did, repeated measurements and they were all over the place, but they averaged out to the right value, that would be accurate, but imprecise, all right? So, and you have the other combinations that won't bother to go through the whole archery lesson. But when we're talking about the width of confidence intervals, that's precision, okay? Accuracy is, a whole different thing, you know, if Flavia quantifies, and I'm gonna pick on you the whole course, I could tell, but if she quantifies the, the amount of um, Mariophyllum, that's an aquatic plant growing here, um, and each time she's missing half of what's there, cause she just, you know, she couldn't see that that well. That's inaccurate, there's a bias, negative bias, cause she's missing somewhat there. So. That would be inaccurate measure of the amount of that meriophyllum that's there. Whereas imprecision is, it's all over the place. Like it's incredibly variable. And you can have, you can be, sorry, I shouldn't have, you can be both inaccurate and imprecise, like, or any combination of those. Um, yeah, and that's why, and I don't say this to critique people. I, it's the kind of thing I think to check yourself you know, check uh, 
what you're doing when you actually look at your data and uh, make interpretations from it. So bottom line with what I just said is, okay, I, I like good, <laughs> I, don't, I, get, I have no idea why I used the voices. <laughs> I went into the like caveman thing. I want small confidence interval, narrow confidence intervals. How do I do that? And you just look at the formula and realize it, it kind of comes down to sample size, right? There's nothing, there's almost nothing we can do about S. And I, I say here, but think about lab studies and, and uh, methods because S is also affected by, you know, if, Flavia, did you, did you use a viewing bucket? So Flavia uses like a glass bottom uh, bucket to look down and say, oh, how much plants are there? And if she's kind of unstable when she's doing it or whatever, it, um, that's gonna add some variability, right? To what she sees. So if she got more stable about doing it, that could potentially reduce S. But I guess what I'm saying here is that there's a there's a certain amount of variability in the observations that you can't do anything about once you've stabilized your methods as much as possible, whether you're in the lab or in the field. The thing that's really under your control and in, in affecting your precision is that N factor. That's how much work did you do? And even that, you know, what's the most common question I've been asked over 30 years as a, someone who's supposed to know about stats? What should my sample size be? You know, how big a sample size do I need? And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But um, sometimes, uh, just people often think, especially when they're first getting into this, there's some magical, yeah, let me just do a few calculations. Okay, five, uh, but or, or whatever. But sometimes it really comes down to um, how much time do you have? What are the resource limitations? things like that. Um, so two is infinitely better than one. Three is a lot better than two. But after that, it, it often is about, especially with observational studies. Um, so logistics, logistics really come into play when you're setting up an experiment, as Flavia is working on a field experiment or lab experiment for that matter. But then observational studies, yeah, there's only so many lakes or whatever in this area. There's only so many possums that we collected or house mice, <laughs> uh, example from last week. So, but but the idea there, and it, it is diminishing returns, you know, it, the, the bigger that N gets, yeah, you're shrinking the standard error of the mean, which is shrinking the width of the confidence interval, but it's a law of diminishing returns because it's the square root of n. So, okay, so hypothesis testing in less than 10 minutes. Because hypothesis testing, I don't, I don't know, you probably already know this well, but hypothesis testing is mathematically equivalent to building confidence intervals. So, um, and it's interpretably identical. It just, it gets more complicated, of course, as we deal with, I don't know, multiple regression or multi-weight uh, ANOVA, all that kind of stuff. But it's hypothesis tests are answering some question posed by your research. As I alluded to in the, in the uh, first class, I've kind of lost my love of hypothesis tests, but I, I wanna make sure you understand them uh, as well as possible. Um, because I know that all of us, myself included, live in a world where we have to be good with them or we just won't be able to uh, share our stuff. We, you won't pass your defense. <laughs> so here's my favorite slide that I've ever, um, I've ever done. And I gotta make sure that sound is on. So let me just share again. Or Emily's gonna miss this, there we are. So this gets to this, and, and everybody here has seen this two by two table, like in your first first stats class. 
Um, notice I haven't I haven't actually shown you a hypothesis test yet because for me it, it's about the decision. So so let's say that um, I've collected the 150 observations of age from uh, first year students here and same thing from second year students. So I have this hypothesis that the mean is different in the two. Excuse me, brilliant hypothesis. So the whole logic of hypothesis tests are this relationship between the data that you collected and the truth. The truth being what, what is true of the populations that you're sampling. So there's a population, complete population of first year students here, complete population of second year students unknowable you know they, they move around too much i don't know i can't so i'm going to sample them and my data you know once we know the mechanics of doing a, a t-test i guess uh, my data are going to lead me to a conclusion about the difference in age between those those two populations my data might say that the null hypothesis is false the null hypothesis being that the two ages of the two mean age is the same so the data might say the, the null is false, the two ages are actually, mean ages are actually different. Or the data might say the null is true. And here's where we get this is the second phrase. He, did he just say the null was true? Like you can't say the null is true. That's bad. You gotta say you failed, remember you failed to reject the null, all that. Forget about that stuff. But, but your data is gonna push you one way or the other, right? The truth, that is, the real situation is maybe the two populations differ in mean age. So HO, the null hypothesis is false. If that's, if that's what your data said and that's what's true, that's great. We've, we've had a good day. So what, my, what I'm writing about in my paper about undergrad age actually truly reflects what's going on in the population. If the data, or sorry, the truth is that the mean age is the same in the two populations, and I conclude that from my data, yeah, I'm gonna accept the null, I'm gonna fail to reject the null, then that's great. So, so both those situations aren't true, right? That's the first thing to come to grips with. They're not, one or the other's true, if the null is really false and I reject the null, that's great. If the null is really true and I accept the null, that's also great. But there's two kinds of errors I can make. And I think everybody's familiar with the first error. And it's, it's uh, romantically called a type one error. And that is, if my data are telling me to reject the null, and for those of you who've lived by the p-value, this is p is less than alpha. Okay, almost always for historical biomedical reasons or agricultural research reasons, we use alpha equals 0.05. But if P is less than alpha, we're going to reject the null. But if reality is that the null is true, we've made a mistake, right? And we don't, we aren't sure whether we've made that mistake or not, but we can by, by the design, the construction of our hypothesis test, we know the probability of making that mistake. So if the null is true and we collect the data, our probability of falsely rejecting the null, incorrectly rejecting the null, is alpha. And we, so we set alpha, actually, because you know how you say, oh, well, alpha is 0.05 in this study, because everybody does that, or we were really careful, so alpha is 0.01. You're actually designing the hypothesis test such that you're controlling that type 1 error probability. The lesser spoken of type of error is if the null is true. Sorry. <laughs> The lesser spoken of error is if the truth is 
the null is false. The mean age is actually different between first years and second years. But I went out, did my sampling, and my data are telling me not to reject the null, to accept it. And that's, a, that's an error of the second kind, type two error. And the probability of that is denoted with beta. Nobody ever talks about beta. I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. You, in, the, in the stats that you've had to do or had to read so far, have you read about beta? Sometimes you'll read about power. Everybody's probably maybe read about a little bit about power. Emily, maybe? Yeah? Yeah, because think about it, um, what, what this is saying. If I make a type two error, um, I've collected my sample, I've done my hypothesis test, I haven't rejected the null, even though I should have. And so it, power, which is one minus beta, is the probability that you're gonna reject a false null hypothesis. So it's, it's kind of, Think of power as my power to discern that difference between, in ages, in my case, between those two populations. So you might be wondering why this is my favorite slide <laughs> ever. So that's the logic of, of every hypothesis test that we'll do in all situations from the simplest t-test to, to uh, multivariate analysis of variance. And the the, profound reality that you have to face is, first of all, we not only don't know if we've made either a type one or type two error, we don't know the truth. We never know the truth. You know, when we do a study, whether it's a lab study or a field study. So we can tell, and, and we'll figure out how to do that, the, the probability of a type one error, which is saying, if what was my chance of getting the data I got if the null is true and if the chance of that is less than what we've uh, deemed as alpha, then uh, we're going to reject the, the null. But And type 2 error, which we'll talk about next week or the week after, but we don't know if we've made an error the two errors, it's not like they add up the probability of it. You know, you either have one situation or the other because we never know the truth. And the reason we never know the truth? You can't handle the truth. Do you know what movie that's from? <laughs> A Few Good Men, Jack Nicholson. <laughs> okay. I know. Pathetic. Okay, God, it's almost three o'clock. I got a, I got a really motor. Okay, example hypothesis test, really, really quick. Uh, I guess this is just looking at that first year class. <laughs> Maybe we'll say this is the fourth year class. That's a pretty high average for a first year class. So fourth year class, the mu equals twenty one years. Uh, alternative hypothesis mu does not equal twenty one years. And notice the hypothesis is expressed with the population value, right? And we're going to use the sample to make some conclusion about the hypothesis. So there it is graphically. You can see the middle of this normal distribution because we're talking about a distribution of sample means centered at mu, the population mean, way back to the central limit theorem. And we're going to take one sample. I don't want to take multiple samples. I'm going to take one sample, and that's what that little yellow dot is there. And testing the hypothesis, which is really just saying, if I, I set these fences, see the two fences here, based on alpha. If alpha is big, then those fences are going to come in. And we'll, we'll do this to death in a couple of weeks. So if alpha is small, they're going to, the fences are going to go out. And that's because I'm going to take a mean of my sample, and it happened to fall here with the sample that I did. And that's quite unexpected if 
if the null is true, if the mean, the population mean is 21. So in that case, think of those fences, those vertical lines there as like decision points. And the decision point, where the decision point is, is based on alpha. And that's telling me, this is telling me graphically that I accept or reject the null. That was a question. Accept or reject. Am I rejecting the null if my sample ended up being where that yellow dot is? This is my test to see if I'm alone in the room. <laughs> I've got a yellow dot. I've got, this is the null hypothesis distribution we're looking at. Accept or reject? Reject. Yes, reject. See, if it was if it was kind of close to the null, I'm not going to reject it. If it's outside of unexpected to get these data I, I, and keep, you know, play this phrase over and over again as you go to sleep. What are the chances I'd get these data if the null was true? If the null was true, it's not the chance of the null being true, which is an common misnomer of it. What are the chances I would have got the data I did, the data, the data I got is the yellow dot, if the null was true, the null being true is this distribution, right? And the chances are pretty slim. Most importantly, they're outside of that fence, which defined, is defined by alpha. They're in the outer 5% of that distribution of the null hypothesis. So I'm gonna reject the null. And then the other common confusion with uh, intro stats is that, you know, remember the one versus two tailed thing. And that's all about your question. It's not about the stats or anything like that. This is a two tailed test. Is the mean of the fourth years 21 years or not? And what that two tailed test is saying is, the yellow dot, which this time, are we going to accept or reject? Now you're getting good at this. Yeah, you speak firmly like you, you know, go to the wall for, yes, accepts. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, we're testing in both directions. It could either be way less than 21 or way more than 21 because our two-tail hypothesis is, is 21 or not. Whereas with a one-tail, you always get that inequality sign. So the null is, the null always contains at least partially an equal sign because that's going to be a distribution. And then the alternative is the alternative to that. So here's a one-tailed version where all of that 5% of the values are stuffed in that one side of the distribution of the null distribution. And that's why, again, if you have these vague memories of, well, you know, your supervisor says to you, well, let's try because the sample mean was, it was pretty different, although it wasn't significant. Let's try a one-tailed test. And that's why the, this one versus two-tailed is all about the science. It's not about the stats. It's not about, we've got to get significance and we're not publishing this puppy. It's so, in this case, there was something about, yeah, fourth years, you know, they're 21 or less. There's no way that the fourth year population is has a mean age of more than 21. So, because notice it's easier to reject with this null distribution than it is with the two-tailed one, because you've got all of that 5% of extreme values stuffed in one tail. Okay, so here's the null hypothesis in words, and this is, I think is the last slide so that's good uh we set up a null and alternative hypothesis all about the science and we establish a chance of a type one error that's building the decision points right that's all it when you say okay i'm going to test at alpha is 0.05 or 0.01 you're you're creating a decision point the trade-off of that with beta as i was talking about we'll get into in a couple of weeks right now we're just going to go with the flow the program Everybody talks about 
Was it significant at 0.05? You know, you say it's significant at 0.1, Bailey, get out of here. You, you know, you're just, that's just an excuse. Okay, so a stab, <laughs> is there two number ones? Jeez. <laughs> and that's recorded now, for God's sakes. <laughs> There was purposely two number ones because you you have to think about those both of those things at the same time. Yeah, I shouldn't have said anything. I should. Yeah, yeah. Of course, there's two number ones. Um, then second, you take a sample, and then you actually collect the data, and then you determine the probability of getting the sample value or more extreme if the null is true. Again, that that's kind of a slightly more awkward way to put it. What are the chances of getting these data, this data set, if the null was true? That's what you're asking when you do a hypothesis test. And if that probability is less than alpha, then you reject. Okay. So that's basic hypothesis testing that. Any questions before we start to uh, we get our computers out and start running our draw a few figures, get that data in.